Hey guys, how's it going? Scotty from ScottsBaseSystems.com and today we're talking about technique. Technique fails. Base technique fails. The reason why I want to talk about base technique fails is because our technique on our instrument is, it's kind of like the foundation of everything we do. If we get this wrong, everything is going to be wrong or 10 times harder than it needs to be. So, we number one, and I'm sure that a lot of you have suffered with this, suffer with it from, like I suffered with it, it is flying fingers, the dreaded flying fingers, okay? And I had a real big issue with this when I started out. So flying fingers, for the most part, it happens around the pinky and the, the ring finger. You'll be playing something such as, for an example, let's take like a major scale, okay? Something like this. And when your ring finger and your pinky aren't engaged and being used, they stick out over here like you want to hang something, like a cup of tea or, Gav, what would you hang on there? My hat. Hat, coat, oh, hat! Job. <gasps> Whoosh. They stick out here like just not doing anything, okay? And that means when we're trying to play a line, our fingers have got way more distance to travel. So if you want to play any faster lines, <laughs> It's going to be just way more clunky and just, yeah, it's going to complicate things for you, okay? So flying fingers, quick exercise, and I'm trying to give you a quick exercise for everything that we covered today, but a quick exercise for flying fingers is just to put one, two, three, four, four fingers next to each other and assign them to four frets. So four fingers, four frets, okay? Play four, two, three, four, okay? Then move up to the next one. One, two, three, four. Next one, one, two, three, four. Next one, one, two, three, four. Now when you're doing it, it's really important that when you hold that index finger down, you concentrate on having these fingers curled over here and engaged, ready to play. They're not out here. One, two, three, four. Next string, one. When, as soon as you play that index, all the fingers again get into place and they're ready to play. Don't worry, if you're trying to play this exercise and you're like, my hand is, this is insane, this is physically impossible for me to play, I'm gonna tell you exactly why. I've got my notes over here. Number six is why it is gonna be physically impossible for you to do that, okay? Hang around for number six. Now next up is the seesaw, okay? The seesaw, the seesaw, madridor. I wonder if it's seesaw, I wonder if it's spelled like that. It is today. The seesaw, we all know what a seesaw does, it does this, yeah? Now, a lot of us suffer with that when we're playing bass, and what this looks like is, Let's take a major scale again. Let's take the C major. Okay, and what happens to a lot of bass players is when they put one finger down, the other ones jump up. I'm gonna do this in slow motion. So you can check this out, okay. So it would look like this. C, D, I put this finger down here and all of these other ones jump up, okay. Then I play this note, all of these be here. I play this note here, this one would jump up, this one, and it looks like this. I cannot tell you how many people do this. It is insane the amount of people that do this, okay? Now the deal is, we shouldn't be doing that. When our little finger goes down, if we're playing this note here, the rest of the fingers should not be sticking out here. They shouldn't be here. They should be on the string. They should be on the string. Check it out. Did you see at any point my fingers sticking out here? No. Here's a little exercise to help with this. You can do it across all strings. I'm gonna just show you how to do it on one string and then you can apply it, okay? So let's start out with the E on the G string, okay? So play the E and then I want you to have all the fingers engaged, kind of like the last exercise over the, um, over the string, ready to play. Remember, if you can't make that stretch, it's because of number six, we're gonna get there in just a second. Now, I want you to play da, de, da. So one, two, one, finger one, finger two, finger one. But when you put finger two down, do not take finger one off. Do, don't do this, because that's the seesaw, right? We just go one, two, one, three, when you put three down, finger three, finger two should go down as well, finger one should still be down. 
No, so we don't want this. We want one, two, one, three, one, four. And when we play one to four, again, all the fingers should be down at this point. So it's gonna look like this. <laughs> Just like that, bit of bond. Number three is the finger, the four finger per fret system. Four finger per fret system is where we get our finger, one, two, three, four, we assign them with numbers, okay? And then we put them across the frets. So we assign a finger per fret. So if you were playing something like a major scale, major scale's our best friend today, right? Okay, the fingers don't move, they're just over the frets. The problem lies where people start using the four finger per fret system for everything. The four finger per fret system is a great system for certain types of lines. So for instance, if I was playing something like. Whatever it is, okay? Linear style lines. Um, for instance, um, I Want You Back by the Jacksons, I played before. The start of that, that um, tune, great, four finger per fret. But what happens when it does? Well, now I'm not using a four finger per fret system. Now I'm using what I call the box system, which is where you play one and four for the most part. So finger one, finger four. And people use this all the time. There's very, very few pro players, if any. I don't think I've ever seen a, a pro player anywhere that uses that four finger per fret system for everything. And also, when you're playing pentatonic runs, like. You want to be using that one and three, that box system, not the four, four finger per fret system. Okay, so next up is crap muting. <laughs> Crap, <laughs> muting. We want to hear the notes that we're playing. We don't want to hear any kind of like sympathetic drones or weirdness underneath. That's what happens when people have got crap muting. First thing to be aware of is that it's worse on five string. It's a little harder to control that low B string. So be aware of that. Next is that there isn't a one size fits all muting system. There's various muting systems. The f and you can mute with your plucking hand and your fretting hand. One would be the uh, floating thumb, where as you play, let's play, oh, you got it, C major scale, as we play, my thumb is gonna move across the strings, it's floating. The next one is what I call the movable anchor, which is what I use, which is where I do have my thumb anchored on something, to, but it's movable, I'm not doing this thing where I'm doing this, where it's just like on the top of the pickup or on the E string and I'm just bending over and playing. I'm not doing that, I'm playing this. And as you can see, my finger is moving along from this string to that string, I'm anchoring it on there. And then the third one, that's a really popular one, is like what I, I kind of think of it as the Jacko method, what Jacko Pastoris used to use, where he used the pinky and the ring finger of his right hand and they dampened the lower strings as he played lines like this. And then obviously he just moved them out of the way when he came down the bass. Now with the left hand or the fretting hand, I don't discriminate about all you, left, all you lefties out there, the fretting hand, there's a few different muting methods. One of them will happen kind of naturally, okay? So as we're playing, the underneath this part of the hand here is muting but these strings down here are muted by this part of the hand, okay? Now, the other thing that happens is really easy to miss as well, is that the second and third finger, and a lot of bass players do this unknowingly, okay? Second and third finger of their fretting hand mutes the strings, of these lower strings here, check this out. Now next up is lack of dynamic range, okay? No dynamics. 
When I'm talking about dynamic range, I mean, I mean like within an actual line. So if I take a pentatonic line such as... Um, something like that, and I could incorporate it within that groove that I was just playing before. I'm trying to play it with no dynamics there, but what happens is we really want to throw dynamics in there. If I just talked to you like this all the time and I didn't really use any peaks and troughs or hills and valleys within my voice, you get bored really quickly. Same thing when we're playing bass. We want to be able to bring certain notes out. We want to keep certain notes back. We want to... Can hear the back, back, back. Okay, that happens because I've got good dynamic range within it's all down to the plucking hand. And to get this into your playing, you want to take exercises such as take a single note, okay? Let's say the E, for instance. And I want you to play one, two, three, four. I want to make sure that you can accent just on the one, okay? One, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. Now I want you to accent on the two. So you're going to be accenting with the middle finger now. One, two, three, four, 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 one, two, three, four. Three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four, one, two, three, four. These are what I call finger independence exercises, which means when you get to play lines, if you listen to a drum playing a snare drum, he doesn't go. Now next up is the inverted wrist on our fretting hand. Inverted wrist. Now, if we've got an inverted wrist, which means our wrist is up like this, okay, it's inverted, it's not round, it's pushed up like this, it doesn't, it takes away the ability to have any kind of like stretch at all within our fretting hand. So if you've been really frustrated and looking at other planes, how do they stretch like that? And I can't. If you open your hand like this in front of you, okay, yeah, you, open your hand in front of you. Can you do this? to a reasonable degree, okay? Now what I want you to do is put your hand in front of you, push your wrist right up, right up, so it's a, a right angle now. Now try and open your fingers. Uh, uh, it's like, it's way hard, and as you straighten that wrist out, it becomes way easier. So as you push it up like this, the wrist, you just, I, it is physically impossible for me to open my fingers. You've got the inverted wrist going on. So drop that wrist down. Also very important, have a little bit of air in here. You don't want this part of the, finger, the hand always in contact with the fingerboard, the underside of the fingerboard here. Now, number seven, okay? Not using, not using hammer-ons and pull-offs. Not using hammer-ons and pull-offs is going to just hold back your playing and the lines that you want to play so much. It is so easy to miss how many great players use them all the time, okay? If you think, like that line that I was playing earlier. I'm even... I'm using there, I'm like pulling off, I'm using slides, I should have put slides in there as well. And then when I played that fill, I'm not picking every single note. So if you do not know, a hammer on is where you play one note and you hammer on the other note and a pull off is where you play one note and you pull it off. It's not a lift off, it's a pull off. You need both of them to be the same volume. So if you hear, you know, like, Anything like that is going to be full of hammer-ons and pull-offs. So that is it for today, guys. But don't go anywhere. I've got something cool for you. Um, but before I tell you about that, and it's free, leave a comment. Let me know which one of these do you think you guys suffer with most. And maybe you'll suffer with more than one. Let me know in the comments. You can put the numbers or the names, or whatever you want. But I would absolutely love to hear from you guys. And it gives me a way of trying to figure out who's suffering with what the most. So it's really, really fantastic information for me as well. The free thing that I mentioned is the Scots Bass Lessons Toolkit. It's like a full free resource full of videos about how to get a great bass tone, what strings I use. I get a luthier and talk to him about 
Uh, it's a master luthier, the guy Chris May behind Overwater Bases. What you should be thinking about when buying a base, body woods, fretboard woods. I talk about amp EQ, how to use the modes effectively on the fingerboard and everything in between. It's totally free. And to get all of that, hit that link below. It'll say toolkit and it'll take you over and then you can get access to it through there. Now, obviously, if you're not subscribed to the channel, do that. You can do that down below and turn your notifications on. Other than that, take it easy and I'll see you in the shed.